start with, let's pretend we're on The Apprentice, can you list the titles that you've worked on? I came in for the indie scene, so I'm like a small press creator and I got, went through Image Comics doing a book called Phonogram, which is kind of my like weird indie calling card. Like, uh, I always talk about if it was the movies, it would be kind of like pie in that kind of, you know, the black, white, the black and white indie movie and that leads to everything else. It got good reviews, which kind of eventually led to me being recommended to Marvel by Warren Ellis, bless his cotton socks. I've never had anyone bless Warren Ellis's cotton That's socks before. If I honestly cut that, I might die. <laughs> uh, like, I don't want to ruin the reputation. No. Like, I'm dead. I wrote The Uncanny X-Men, I wrote Iron Man, I wrote Four. I wrote a very, a very long Loki series. I wrote uh, Young Avengers. I went over to Star Wars books at the moment, so I'm doing Darth Vader. Just the biggest comics ever of all time. Imagine a big toy box. I have played with most of the toys. Okay. Yeah. You're that boy. Yes, I'm, like, I'm the very rich parent boy, and I've had, you know, I, I probably you. have an atta. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> I, I'm not a Star Wars geek, but I know a bit about mm. it. So in the latest movie, is it that they've got rid of all the canonical stuff that happens? Uh, basically, before the, the new movie started, there was this thing called the Extended Universe. And okay. the Extended Universe was this very broad, of flexible canon. As in, it's like, could that be novels? That could be yeah, loads it was, of it was, stuff. it was the whole thing, and you never really had quite idea what was canon and what wasn't. So and, canon means official oh, yes. history? Official history, yes. As in, what was actually... So in other words, it's all kind of a bit contradictory, because it's in so many different places. Got it. So at the start of the new movie, they made something called the Story Group. And the Story Group basically defined what canon was, and they stripped it way back. Did you make it in? Yes. yes. Actually, no, anything new is canon now. Okay. Yes. So it was, like, it was basically the movies, the cartoons. But that's a huge responsibility, that now what you're creating is... Fully part. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, when I was offered the job of Darth Vader, I was like, do I... Sorry, say that again? When I was offered the job of Darth Vader... That's probably the best sentence I've ever heard in my was, life. My, phone, my life does involve getting phone calls saying, do you want to write Darth Vader? And I go, hmm? And it was, it was kind of, am I the right man for the job? I would have just gone... <laughs> <laughs> down the phone. There was a lot of me in my dressing gown, walking around the house, doing that breathing noise. And you did... <laughs> only when making tea. Okay. Just like before you walked in, I was like, it's quite weird. I've been reading your comics for years and I'm going to talk to you. Do you have as a creator moments like that where you're like, I can't believe I'm getting to write for these characters? It's a weird job. Like, I, I kind of thought I was a weirdo indie, indie creator. Okay. So when Marvel proved to be interested in me, that was like, a, oh. It was like suddenly going to, a, going to the club and suddenly people who I had no idea were going to hit on me were Did, hitting on me. Oh, I love the idea of being hit on by people you didn't know you were going to hit on. It is. It's like, I, I'm, I'm the prettiest one. Sort of <laughs> yeah. Thing. I'm uh, the prom queen. <laughs> yes. Um, what are the differences then, just generally, between, say, working with an established history like the, the Star Wars mythology, um, the Marvel, these characters have existed for ages, and then working for a creator-owned project like, where, like your work for Image? I would describe Marvel can as a bit like a rainforest. Wow. It's like, yeah, it's kind of contradictory. Which war did Tony Stark get the armor in? And it's varied and it's flexible. And there's a constant idea that basically the Marvel Universe has existed for 12 years. Like, Is that how young everyone's supposed to yeah. be? How do they explain and, the haircuts? I know. It, the mullets. The fundamental mystery of the Marvel Universe, you have to simultaneously understand that the Fantastic Four watched the moon landings at the same time they only formed after 9-11. The so time, time is squashed and stretched at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You have to, ba that's a kind of like... It's a, like a weird night out when you get really drunk. <laughs> it's a lot of ketamine. Okay. Uh, basically, the, uh, the Star Wars universe is a start from scratch and being quite disciplined with it, it's more like a kind of like a French uh, emperor's mansion. It's all like very carefully planned. You can't use Boba Fett because Boba Fett at this part of the timeline's in prison. So, so the Marvel Universe is a rainforest. Star Wars is a French mansion. Yes. What is w Wicked and the Divine? <laughs> so, Wicked the Divine is our Manhattan's project. I certainly find that's this <laughs> an incredibly complicated and impossible task we're building from scratch. Brilliant. I mean, there's a line that uh, Scott Snyder, the, Amer the amazing American comic writer, uses about the difference between create your own and work for hire. With work for hire, you, it's like you've got this character and everyone loves them, like Batman or Darth Vader. Yes. And it's like, everyone cares about them. The job is working out how to make yourself care about them. And the flip, wow. and the crow own thing is, oh, I've got this thing I care about intensely. I've made this up, I've grown it, it's my child. How on earth can I make anyone else care about this thing? How do you build a mythology from scratch versus how do you carry on practicing another mythology? Okay. And ideally, I try to do multiple scripts in a row until I get bored of that, then I... I can tell your brain works really fast. As all this stuff is going on, I'm trying to like vomit it forth. And comics is fun. I think quickly, at least on limited access. Okay, so going to Phonogram, that is the soundtrack to my teen years. <laughs> How did that come about and why did you want to make a comic about and directed by Britpop? I used to be more of a music obsessor than I am, you know, in terms of like what I was that guy. And I worked as a music journalist, blew up major parts of my life over music. Phonogram is kind of my mythology. And the idea of like, okay, I want to do a comic where I take 
all my theories about music and the social group I was in and throw it through an urban fantasy filter. The point of the first phonogram is, it's about the idea of like somebody who was heavily invested in the scene 10 years on, and for the first time they are seeing stuff that they were there for being repackaged by capitalism. You start to feel nostalgia for the first time and questioning so it. So is it also about feeling old? Yeah, yeah, almost, that's the thing, is almost all my books, despite being about youth culture, about going out of it and like questioning why you, why you care about that so much. There's a surprising amount of people who read phonogram and they don't like music and they just map in any fan obsession. What weirdo doesn't like music? But there's certain like mental quirks some people have and they just hear noises. If you think about it carefully, we're, anyone who actually hears music are the ones with the, the weird bug. As in, you know, why on earth does music make us feel like that? It's, it's like a bug in our brain. Uh, well, so people who don't do that are much more, that's a much more reasonable way to see the universe. If we're sort of, imagine that's, me Object. speaking as if an alien was looking yeah. at us. You know Why I mean? are you crying listening to those noises? Mental I'm not mystery. saying I cry every no, night I... listening to music. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I want to talk about the Wicked and the Divine. Good. <laughs> what is the Pantheon? We're working at Marvel on a book called Young Avengers, and after that, we wanted to do a book of our own. And it's kind of like growing from our experiments with Young Avengers. Young Avengers was the idea of this very aggressive book about a group of teenagers, and this is kind of a HBO approach to that. Yeah, it's like that, but cranked up a few notches. Yeah, it's like Young Avengers After Dark. <laughs> <laughs> but we started from scratch, and the idea was, okay, let's build a mythology book, because there's so much about mythology in my other books. Yes. And the idea kind of came, well, this gets, and it gets depressing quickly at this point. My dad died in the year Young Avengers we were writing, and my idea for Wicked and Divine happened came to me like the week after he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Wow. And the idea that, you know, it's my immediate response to grief. And the idea being that, you know, these gods, which is the start of the story, reincarnate in Earth every 90 years. They're loved, they're hated, they are perform, because they're primarily artists, and then in two years they're dead. This is my way to sort of question, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's 70 years, or 20 years, or 10 years, or two years, with the time we have on Earth is desperately finite. So why the hell do we do anything with it? I'm pretty goth. Was it, was it, <laughs> was it, <laughs> um, was it cathartic for you then processing your dad's illness and, and, and the concept of death? Uh, in 2014, I was a mess, it, like a variety, for a variety of reasons. Mm. Uh, like, and it was just, a, and obviously I was 38, so I was about to be 40. So there's all manner of like midlife crisis stuff happening as well. <laughs> and kind of part of the design of Rictive was, let me do a book, uh, me and Jamie do a book about everything we've ever loved. Like, so this is most obviously pop music, yes. but like, it, the more people go into it, there's the literature, there's all manner of fantasy stuff. We even bring in like the Warhammer miniatures at one point. Like everything we've ever loved is in that book. Uh, and then we're gonna set fire to it. We're gonna make 12 people I would have killed to be, and then we're gonna kill them all. I read also that Prince's death and Bowie's death affected you. Did that, what, at what point did, did that happen in the... The, char the characters have got both A, inspired by various gods from various pantheons across time. Uh, but they're also like inspired by artists. Well, I was going to say, there's one that looks very like Florence and the Machine. Yeah, I mean like... One that looks like Rihanna. At what point does... Is it you? So Jamie's the artist that you work with. Do you, is that him? Is that you? Is it a combination of We talk of about both? archetype. And basically, our idea that each of the pop stars, while they may, may, their visuals may draw more obviously from one person, yes. there's the idea of archetypes. Sort of like Ball, a lot of people say Ball's a bit like Kanye, but Ball's a lot about other people other than Kanye. They're people who work in a certain mode of art. And they've worked throughout history and yeah. they've come um, back yeah. throughout history. And I kind of like, and that's it, what, what do those sort of artists do in every stage of history, is our kind of thing. But like, Florence is a character called Amaterasu. But you know, Florence is basically, she's also Kate Bush. Yes. She's also Stevie Nicks. She's very Kate Bush yes. and she's very Stevie. And it's like any woman who sang whilst not wearing shoes. That's my normal definition basically, of Amaterasu. Take your shoes off yes. and you're a goddess. Feel the three. One of our characters is based around quite often inspired by Bowie and another character is quite heavily influenced by Prince. Yeah, we that. killed that character off before Bowie died in real life. And wow. we killed our Prince analogue before we killed, before Prince died in real life. Since I'm not was, blaming you, but I feel I like did. it could really... Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, when the first time... Do you feel that you'd magic their death? The Bowie one felt weird because the actual, when the Lucifer character dies, the day he, uh, she dies on is the day we all responded to uh, Bowie's death. As in, Bowie died the day before, but the actual day to, an actual death was the day the world was responding to him. Like, one year earlier in the comics time stream. But yeah, that's a weird coincidence. When our Prince, sort of, the character was informed by Prince died, we immediately rushed to see what time, uh, and no, it's completely different, which is lucky. Oh, but I was like, uh, I was going to call the police. We're going to the co-op afterwards, and I'm really quite freaked out. Chrissy, who's the editor on Wicked, had to sort of say, Kieran, you did not kill Prince. Sure. <laughs> and it's true, but like, there's the something that it wasn't me. I feel like it might have been you. It wasn't me. Okay. Talking about Laura, who's the the kind of the reader's way into the story, mm. she reminded me of myself a lot. I used to come here to Gosh Comics when I was like 13, and she's like the typical outsider that's obsessed with subculture. The sort of slow route I made from 
you know, being your side of the, being, yes. being asking the questions to answering the questions. And how weird that is, that's Laura's character character arc and how she deals with it. And in my case, the people I met along the way. On I mean, your journey, of, did you have people's heads blowing up and stuff like metaphorically. that? Metaphorically. Right, okay. In the case of Laura, like, you know, uh, she's a South London girl. Yeah. And explicitly as I live in Lewisham and I was like, I would just like a girl like a Lewisham girl to be the lead character. Cause Brilliant, because you don't get Lewisham, you don't get comics about mixed race girls from Lewisham. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, I was kind of like, if we're going to make a modern mythology that try to inspire people, we want to make it like, be the world we live in. As a writer, I think what you're saying then is that you're just reflecting back what's happening around you. So the culture we live in is diverse, gender, sexuality, race, and so you're just representing that. If the art our culture produces is less diverse than the culture actually is, our art is failing us would be my one-liner. There's an argument which I, which I entirely agree with, that basically representation is about seeing yourself in media, and, and the fact that predominantly white straight people, white straight male people are the people who get to do that, yes. mainly in Western culture, in many genres, is a problem. Uh, but the flip of that, it's all, which I agree with, I think we should have many more people so can, people can see themselves in different forms on screen. It's incredibly human and powerful to empathise with people who aren't you. And yes. that's kind of, what, of course, what people, apart from white straight male people, have had to do all along. <laughs> Sorry to get all intellectual on you, but um, so Freud says that everything, every character in our dream is us. Mm. A dream is a work of the imagination. I would say that what you do is a, a work mm. of the imagination. So all the characters in your stories are a bit of you. Which one is most like you? It's funny. I say, it's like, this is explicitly how I talk about Wigdiv. As when I say, all the characters, I said, either people I would have loved to have been at any point, but they're also explicitly parts of me span out into four characters. These are explicitly me analysing my failings. Uh, and the, the characters are contradictory. Yes. They're like, that's different. That's absolutely different parts of me. I'm very, you know, part of me is absolutely Dionysius, who kind of wants to give too much to everyone. And there's part of me who's Woden, who's a complete shit. Wow. More it's like clear. therapy for you. Oh yeah, definitely. It's, it's like um, I tell my therapist. It's like you should absolutely. stop paying your therapist because you're doing it anyway. You're getting paid for it. I'm just giving the book. I, I <laughs> yeah. just, read this, and this explains this everything. This is me. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask you some questions um, from the Vero community. This is from Dexter Washington. Thank you for your question, Dexter. Thanks, Dexter. You're a great guy. I'd be curious to know, what has been your hardest project to date? They're all hard in exquisite ways, exquisitely awful ways. Probably Wikdiv. The problem with Wikdiv, of course, is A, difficulty, and B, scale. Um, CBM Hype, terrible name. Uh, my question for Kieran <laughs> I like would, you. Uh, I, think, I think it's awful. Um, what inspired you to be a comic book writer? I come from a fanzine background. Brilliant. So uh, I got into comics circa 2000, and part of being a fanzine background is doing the art can be the same thing as appreciating the art. So in other words, if I was into music, everyone in fanzines was in crappy bands. So in the same way, part of my immediate response to get into comics was doing comics, because you kind of love it that much. You know that thing where children eat letters or stuff? Yeah. Just eat stuff they really like. Yeah. It's like that. The idea that you both well, devour it and vomit it up, and that's kind of why I started doing a comic writer. That's a disgusting way to explain. It really is awful. Uh, this is from Anthony Madge, and I'm assuming that you're uh, Australian, because he starts with, G'day, Kieran. <laughs> G'day. What's your best <laughs> advice to a noob? That's a newbie, a new person, who's unpublished and trying to break into the industry. And then he does this, this little emoji. The thing about comics is it's incredibly democratic. Al Ewing, who's like one of Marvel's best writers, he still occasionally gets an A4 sheet, folds it up into like tiny squares, and then draws a comic on each, a panel on each one of those pages and gives them to people. That's how easy it is to like stop doing comics. There's no shame in self-publishing. Yes. There is a community based around people doing photocopied work of their first time. There's web comics communities. As it builds an audience and as people see you. That's very positive and oh, helpful. Yeah. It's okay. sort of like, just do it. It's like the, okay, this is Anthony, fancy just kit. do it. Kieran, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think it's been inspiring and I understand your work in a new way. And I understand your work in a new way. My work is sitting and listening.